You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number 50. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm Katie Wardrobe, a music technology education trainer, speaker and consultant from midnightmusic.com.au where I help music teachers use technology effectively in music education. I'm so excited today to say that we've made it to number 50, episode number 50. It took a little bit longer than I had hoped to get here, but we have made it. My plan going forward is actually to try and get further ahead with podcast episode recordings so that they are published on a weekly basis, which was actually always my original plan, but sometimes life gets in the way and it doesn't always happen the way I want it to, but I'm going to really try hard to get them out on a weekly basis very consistently from now on. At this time I have a few episodes already recorded which is a really good thing and they will start coming out over the next few weeks. So today I wanted to celebrate episode 50 by talking about 10 tech things that I'm loving right now. My original idea for this episode was to perhaps list 50 different apps and software programs that I think are really great for music teachers or just for people in general but I decided that that would be maybe a little bit too overwhelming, listing 50 different ones, so I'll save that idea up for something else, maybe a blog post instead. Now, the 10 things that I'm going to talk about today, some of them are new and some of the things I've been using for a really long time, but they're the kind of things that when I use them during my everyday life, I think, wow, this is just so good. This is saving me time or I love the way this works. And that's what I thought I'd share with you today. You may already be using a lot of these. Uh, Perhaps some will be new to you. And if you get a chance to give me feedback and let me know what things might be on your own personal list of 10 things that you love to use every day, it would be great to compare and see if we have matching lists or items along the way. So let's get on to the 10 tech things that I'm loving right now. So the first thing is my new MacBook Pro. Now I've been using the same MacBook Pro, my previous one, for a long time and I am not one of those people, surprisingly, (laughs) because of the business that I'm in, I think people assume that I upgrade things really frequently and have a lot of new gear around me all the time. But it's simply not true. I don't rush out and buy the latest and greatest thing every time it comes out. I'm not one of those people that line up at the Apple store when there's a new product and I kind of wait for a little bit and see what pans out and, you know, see things what, which things are going to stick and be useful and longer lasting, I suppose. However, an everyday laptop is, you know, not really a, a sort of a, a thing that you buy very frequently. And it's also a thing that you should have a, a decent one that's working really well for you. And I had made my old MacBook Pro last for quite a long time. It was a, a late 2011 model. And I actually mentioned that to a group of music teachers I was pretending to a couple of weeks ago. They were kind of shocked that I was using a MacBook Pro from that year. And now that I think about it, you know, it, it did last me quite a long time. So over time, I, you know, sort of um, updated a few things within the MacBook Pro to make it run a little bit faster. And that was okay. But to be honest, at the end, it was just getting really slow and, you know, I, I could see the spinning rainbow beach ball a lot of the time every time I went to open something or do something with a process that was a little bit resource heavy, uh, particularly things like video editing or music and audio editing, uh, which happens to be pretty much all I do on my MacBook Pro. <laughs> it was really struggling with those tasks and I had decided it's just time to upgrade. So uh, the other thing was that, uh, you know, as time went on with my older MacBook Pro, I was finding it was really heavy and probably a little bit larger than I needed. It was a 15-inch MacBook Pro. So I decided to go out and buy a 13-inch one, which is the newest model. And, oh my gosh, I'm loving it so much. The The processing speed is so much faster. My productivity has really increased. And 
I know that that's probably something that people might say in order to convince another person that they really need to get a new laptop. But in my case, it was absolutely true. Uh, and the, the the thinness and lightness of the newer model is fantastic. I actually wondered if I would perhaps go for a different option, which was to buy a, a desktop version of a Mac, so an iMac, and perhaps get a Mac, an Air, a MacBook Air to go with that so that I could just take that on um, sort of presenting and that sort of thing. But to be honest, the new MacBook Pros are just so light and thin themselves that it, it didn't make sense to do that in the end. So so that's the first thing that I'm really loving. Um, it's just made my life a lot better. I'm enjoying work again uh, and I can sort of sit away from the power supply, which, you know, in the past, my, my old one was really, the battery was draining down so fast that it wouldn't last for very long at all off the power supply. And I'm loving the fact that my laptop actually works like it should as a laptop where I can take it and be portable and just loving it. It's just great. So that's the very first thing. The second thing on my list is kind of semi-related and that is uh, using a second monitor when I'm at home and, you know, I'm talking here a large screen monitor which I have set up on my desk at, in my office at home. Now, this is, again, the monitor is actually something I've had for years and years. I haven't needed to upgrade it or update it. I'm sure if I went out and bought a new one, it would be, you know, nicer. It would probably have better graphics, but I really don't need anything more than the one I have at the moment. And the great thing about monitors nowadays is that they are so inexpensive, realistically. The thing I found is that it makes me more productive. So this is only something I use when I'm at home. So when I'm at home, I have my MacBook Pro still on my desk and I plug it into this external monitor. And what it does is it gives me two screens to work on simultaneously. Now, some of you that perhaps have not tried using a second monitor when you're working at your desk may think that this is a little bit indulgent, but it's so good. And once you've tried it, I think it's that case of you'll never go back again. And I don't have access to it all the time. Obviously, I'm not using it when I'm out and about on the road. It's only when I'm at home working uh, in my, my home office. But it's just so good for things like music software programs, where you need a little bit more screen real estate or video editing programs and even day-to-day -day things like Word documents and email and, you know, keynote presentation or PowerPoint files, it can be really useful having this second monitor. So I use it in a couple of ways. Uh, the main way that I use it is that, well, it's, it's my primary workspace when I have it plugged in. So it's straight dead ahead in front of me. And my MacBook Pro is actually off to the left a little bit. It's not right in front of my head when it's turned forward. So in essence, my monitor, my external monitor becomes the main screen that I'm working on. And the MacBook Pro becomes kind of my secondary screen. So what I do is I put the main program that I'm working on, whether that's just Google Docs or whether it's something like uh, video editing software or GarageBand or Sibelius or whatever music program I'm working on, that goes on the main big monitor. And the MacBook Pro, I leave for other things like perhaps my email software or uh, Slack, which is a, a communication tool. It's a little bit like uh, an instant messaging tool that you can use for business purposes. I often have that on the MacBook Pro, just off to the left. Uh, Skype, if I have that open, I have that on to the left screen as well. And those things can just kind of sit there and be there ready when I need them out of the corner of my eye. And they don't need to be front and center all the time. The other thing I do is often if I'm writing something like a new course or perhaps I'm putting together a presentation or doing some research for a blog post, I might have the research elements off to the left on the MacBook Pro screen. So I might have a Wikipedia article open or, you know, some other interesting online articles or a YouTube video that I'm going to watch, you know, to do with the topic that I'm researching but I'll have the main document that I'm working on in front of me. So it's just really good for spreading stuff out and being a little bit more productive. 
As I said, if you haven't tried it, I can highly recommend giving it a go. It just plugs in to your laptop in the same way that you plug in your data projector. So either with a VGA cable or with an HDMI cable. And then you can uh, choose your settings on the laptop to say that you want, when the monitor's plugged in, that you want that to be your main screen. Really, really good. Okay, number three, the third thing that I'm loving, which is a tech-related thing, is having systems and processes written down in an online location. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and I may cover this in more detail in a future episode, but one of my productivity killers in the past has been when I'm in that situation where I can't remember how to do things. It's usually a system or a process that I've done in the past and it's been so long since I've done it that I've forgotten what the steps are or where I go to do it or do I go to this thing or do I click here or what's the thing I do first? Oh, and I I did this thing but now it's in the wrong order and I've got to go back and retrace my steps. All of those things make me so frustrated and unproductive realistically. So, What I found, and you know, I listen to a lot of business podcasts, online business podcasts, and a number of people, I was hearing this sort of recurring theme uh, throughout a number of different podcasts that I was listening to about writing things down. So what I started to do was to write down every single process that I do, and it's things that I do on a regular basis, and especially things that I don't do on a regular basis, writing them down somewhere that's easily accessible. So for me, I use Google Docs, so I tend to just open up a Google Doc, I write down the process in the document, and then it's saved and I can access it on all of my different devices. Now, things that I'm writing down include, for instance, uh, it might be how to publish a blog post on my website. That might be one example. We have processes in my business which include things like how to put together the weekly newsletter. Uh, It might be how to send someone an invoice or it might be uh, one that I did recently was how to log into a certain site where I needed to make a payment because I was I kept forgetting do I go to this website or this website to do that. So I just simply write it down in a Google document and now it's there for the next time when I don't remember <laughs> again. My brain, I've discovered, only holds certain types of information actually in its memory and I think my brain just prioritises things and decides that there's a lot of stuff that it does not need to hold on to And so things like this are really great when they're written down. Now, the next step after writing them down in a Google document, the next really useful thing you can do is put links to all these online documents in a single spreadsheet. So using the example of my business, we have all these procedures written down, things that I do all the time, things that my assistant does. We have a couple of people that work in the business And no matter who does the procedure, we each write them down and save them in a Google document. So the next stage is that we actually have a spreadsheet which is called the Midnight Music Training Catalogue. And inside that spreadsheet are a list of all these procedures just in one column. And then in the next column, there's basically a place where we can paste a link to the document. So this is great. It creates kind of like an index to all of the different procedures that we have written down. So what you can do is you can go into the spreadsheet first of all and do a little search and find the thing that you need. And then in there, you can just click on the link, which will take you to that document. I found this useful time and time again uh, from a business point of view and this would also be applicable if you are working with other staff in a, you know, in a department, so a music department, if there's more than one music staff at your school, you could have things written down and have them listed in a shared spreadsheet the way that we do. The great thing is that if one of us is away and someone else needs to fill in a task or do something while that person is not there, We can go into the the spreadsheet and just check the procedure and do it without them present. The key to this is writing clear instructions. So they're very step by step. It's literally go to this website, log in with these details, do this, do this, do this, all in order. And sometimes if we've got the time and we think it's going to be useful, we actually add screenshots into the document as well, which helps the person reading it 
know what they should be seeing and what to look for when they're doing that particular task. So that's really great. If someone's suddenly sick, we can go in and do the task for them and the procedure's all written out. The other benefit is that if a staff person moves on to a different job altogether and leaves the business, all of the procedures are written down for the next new person that starts and you always hope that there's going to be some crossover time where the old staff member can train the new one, but occasionally you don't get to everything or perhaps you don't get a lot of time to do that training. So having everything written down is just fantastic. It's really saved my brain (laughs) and... uh, It just is more relaxing, less anxiety inducing when you know everything is written down somewhere. I've started to do it even for home related things, so non-business related things, because I think that over time, for instance, my own kids might take on some of the things that I'm doing as they're getting older and just to have them written down is so great. Each of the Google Docs where there's a procedure is really, it can be really brief. It might be just a whole A4 page with three steps written on it. That might be all that's needed. Uh, Some of them are multiple pages long because they're a bit more detailed and they might have those screenshots in them. The other thing that we do occasionally is make a video and I'm going to talk about that as one of my other things that I'm loving from a tech point of view. But you can make a little screencast video talking the person through the procedure and that's also a great thing to link in that spreadsheet where the whole list of links is. So number four, on to number four, and this is to do with communication. So, uh, and this is really something I use for business alone. It's not something I use in my personal life, but when I'm communicating with other people in my business, you know, we often use instant messaging. So we can type a message to one another, which we will either go back and forth in real time. And sometimes we just type a message and leave it for the person whenever they're going to read it next. And that's fine. We use um, primarily use Slack for that, which I mentioned earlier. But sometimes I'm finding uh, that it can be a bit time consuming and cumbersome to type a message. And sometimes you're not always in the place where you can easily type. For instance, if you're driving in the car or just walking around, you don't always have time to stop and actually type. I get frustrated if there's got to be a lot of back and forth and we're typing a lot all the time. Now, You might be thinking, well, why don't you just phone the person? (laughs) And that is also possible. But uh, a lot of the people I work with in my business are actually overseas. So it's not always convenient to call one another, um, A, from a perhaps a cost point of view, uh, although we can use free uh, calls like Skype and that sort of thing. But the time difference, you know, the difference between time zones doesn't always mean that it's easy for us to, you know, actually talk to one another at that time. So the next best thing is an app that we've been using called Voxer. It's V-O-X-E-R. And this is a communication tool which allows you to leave audio messages back and forth with one another. It works a little bit like a walkie-talkie. So, and, and there's basically two ways that we use it. We either use it when the two of us that are conversing are both there and online at the same time. And sometimes we don't, we just leave a message for the other person which they're going to listen to later. So when you open up the app, you find the person you want to talk to or leave a message for, you hold down the button, the talk button, and you keep holding it down while you're leaving your message and you keep talking and then you let go and the message goes through to the other person. Now, if they happen to be online at that time and they hear your message, you can see a little thing which says that the message has been played by the other person and they can go ahead and leave you a message straight away at the same time. So they'll uh, hold the button down at their end, they'll talk into their app and they'll leave you a message. And you can have some great back and forth conversations like this and it can be just really quick. It's not as intrusive as doing a full-blown phone call where you feel like you've got to perhaps make small talk first and um, ease into the conversation. This is great because we get straight to the point, we leave the message and we all have an understanding that we're not expecting the person to listen to it instantly. They will get to it when they get to it. 
and it's just been great. So there are times where we do have a back and forth conversation for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Other times I'll leave a message for one of my colleagues and they'll get back to it, you know, maybe in four hours time when they get up and leave me a return message after that. It's just so much easier than typing a lot of stuff all the time. It's I find it it's just easier to say things sometimes. So this is a great solution for us. My fifth thing that I'm loving is Asana and this is a task management tool. I actually spoke about it in an earlier episode. I believe it was Music Tech Teacher episode number seven and that was a, I did a couple of productivity tip episodes uh, in episode seven and episode eight and I spoke about Asana at that time. I won't go into too much detail because I'm pretty sure I covered it in a bit more detail in those episodes anyway but just to say that this is a great thing to do if you are perhaps having trouble keeping on top of your to-do list or if you find yourself with a lot of post-it notes everywhere. I really have a a dislike for lots of bits of paper. Uh, It's a surefire way for me to lose really important information and In years past, I have had heart failure thinking about, you know, something that I remember vaguely writing down on a post-it note or on a a notepad somewhere and then not being able to find it or not remembering where I wrote it or which type of thing it was on and where I was at the time when I wrote it down. Horrible. Just an awful feeling. So I'm really making an effort to put things into a digital format, which is just easier to find and you can... Usually, depending on which app you use, but most of them will work across multiple devices. So you can set up something on your laptop, but then access it from your phone. And I just find this really great. So if you are looking for a task management tool, it doesn't have to be Asana, but that's the one that's working for me. It's one where I can have my own to-do lists. I can have tasks which have sub tasks in them as well so it can be an overarching task and there might be a number of steps that I need to do to complete that I can set that all up in Asana there's great satisfaction in ticking them all off as you get them done and for some reason Asana has this kind of random thing where every few tasks that you complete it will send across a flying unicorn over the screen and it's kind of cool or some other creature uh, and it's it's a little bit random, so you don't always know when they're going to appear. So you're constantly wanting to check tasks off just so that you see them. <laughs> but in addition to that, it's a great tool for collaborating with other people. So the other people that I work with in my business, we all share access to my work Asana account and we can all access things in there. So it's great. Someone can set up a task or a project in there and invite other people to be part of it. We can comment on it for each other. We can attach uh, documents to the task as well. So if there's a document which, which is relevant to that task, we attach it there. We can link to certain things. It's just a great place to have everything in a very central way and keep track of things. This episode of the Music Tech Teacher podcast is brought to you by the Midnight Music Community. The Midnight Music Community is an online space for music teachers who'd like help using technology in their music lessons. There are online courses, video tutorials, lesson plans, music tech news, and professional development certificates are provided for any training that you undertake. I'm inside the community every day, personally answering members' questions and sharing tips and ideas. The best thing is that you get to connect with hundreds of other music teachers just like you and share your own experiences and occasional music tech frustrations. For more information and a special joining price just for the listeners of this podcast, visit midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. That's midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. Number six in my tech tools or tech things that I'm loving at the moment is screencasting. So I mentioned screencasting uh, earlier and this is where you hit record and record something that's on your screen and you usually talk over the top of that. Uh, The time that you do this is for creating instructions for something or giving feedback for something as well. That's a really good use of screencasting. Now, I've been using screencasting for a long, long, long time and it's something that I do really frequently. 
Uh, I create uh, videos a lot for courses that I'm running in the online community and all the videos that you see are screencast videos where I've opened up the music software and or website and I hit record in my screencasting software and I record what I'm doing and I talk through it at the same time uh, explaining what I'm doing or giving instructions. Now you can use it for that where you've got sort of like a more formal video like those ones are where I'm doing a teaching thing or the other time I use it is for really quick responses to something. So uh, there's two separate tools that I use. Now for my longer more professional videos I use ScreenFlow which is a Mac tool. Uh, there's Camtasia as well which is a PC based option but ScreenFlow is the one that I use because I'm on a Mac and that's the one that I, I open up and I create videos in for the courses that I'm doing and for perhaps YouTube videos or that type of thing. The other thing that I've been using more recently, and this one is for really great for super fast videos, is an online-based screencasting tool called Loom, L-O-O-M, Loom. And this one's really good for giving a quick response to someone about something. So for in my business, uh, we use it, uh, there's, a, there's two or three of us in the business where we might need to just explain something or show something that's maybe not working on the website that needs to be fixed. Uh, so this is a great one for using with the website developer, for instance. Okay, so I open up my website, I, I hit record in Loom and I just explain what it is that's not working quite so well and can he fix it. Now it's much easier for, for him if I've recorded a video showing what it is that I need help with or need fixing rather than me writing out a long message in Slack which says can you please do this, it's this button on this page which is up at the top right hand corner and in text it takes a long time to describe and also as the person reading it, it takes a long time to sort of comprehend and work out what the person's talking about. If you can hit record and cre create a quick video, it's so much easier because they can see your mouse pointer moving around and you can click on things or highlight things while you're actually making the video. So that's one way to use it is, you know, internally for work, we use it to comment on things or give feedback about things that way. The other thing I'm finding it really useful for, and I'm, I'm going to probably do this a lot more in the future, is answering questions for people. So in the online community, the Midnight Music community, we have a forum section where uh, people who are, part, who are members in there can ask questions at any time about anything music tech related. Now, we ordinarily type out a response. This is me or Martin, who I work with in my community, who also answers questions. We'll type out a response and sometimes we include uh, pictures, screen screenshots to explain something. But it can be also really useful just creating a video. And once again, the same reason that I like using Voxer for communication, when I'm screencasting, I'm just talking through the 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 process or the problem and explaining it on the fly and it's so much quicker than typing a response. Brilliant. It's just great. Now Loom is an online software application which is actually something that you install into the Chrome browser. So you need to be using Chrome and you download Loom as a Chrome extension and it just ends up being a little button in your Chrome browser at the top right which you can click at any time and you can say what it is that you want to record. Is it part of your screen or is it a specific software application? And you can record, choose to record yourself as in the picture of yourself, your face as well, or you can just record your screen alone. Most of the time I'm recording my screen alone because I figure people don't really need to see my face while I'm talking. Uh, it's more important for me to show the entire screen and explain things that way. So you just hit record, you do your thing, and then you click stop at the end. Now, the reason I really love Zoom is that as soon as you finish, it provides you with a link to your video. It's an online video and it provides you with a link straight away. I've used other screencasting options in the past, which are either browser-based or software that you download for this sort of purpose. And in the past, you usually have to wait for the video to kind of upload or render or something and there's a waiting time in there 
And the danger is that you're waiting and you get distracted and go on to the next thing and kind of forget that you've just made this video and that you need to send it to someone. Loom, because it's so instantaneous, it's fantastic. You can just grab the link straight away, go over to the, well, for me, it's the Midnight Music Community Forum, or it could be into an email even, and I can just paste the link in there and say, hey, take a look at this video. I've explained it in here. And then the other person gets a link, they click on it and it shows them the Loom video in their browser at their end. Super fast. The other good thing is that in your Loom account, which is free to set up, you can also see all the past videos that you've created. So you can go back through, you end up with a library that builds up and it's just fantastic. So I can highly recommend using Loom for quick videos. I think this would be a great tool to use if you need to give students feedback on an assignment. I think screencasting is a great option for providing feedback. You can open up the student assignment on your computer and then hit record and talk through your feedback rather than or in addition to providing written feedback as well. So it might depend on the type of assignment, but if you're able to provide feedback through a screencast video, it can be really great. And the benefit of that also is that students can hear the inflections in your voice. I think sometimes when you provide feedback for things, uh, we all know what it's like getting text messages from people where it's really difficult to read tone. In a video, you can hear the person's voice and what you might read in a text message as being a little terse or maybe a bit negative, uh, perhaps is not at all. And the way that they hear your voice speaking it through might come across more accurately. Now, number seven is a super simple one. And this is one of those ones. Uh, I think I feel like because I'm, you know, in my mid 40s, I have a really great appreciation of things that we did not grow up with, you know, technology wise. And I'm simply loving internet banking on my mobile phone. And it's such a ridiculously small thing. Anyone who was born in more recent years would just, you know, kind of roll their eyes and go, yeah, whatever, that's just so simple and easy. But <clears throat> to be honest, it's made life so much easier just being able to access my internet banking wherever I am. Those times where, you know, you forget that a bill has gone through with your main account and suddenly you've got a lot less than you thought you had. But it's okay, there's money in another account and you just need to transfer it across. And you're in the supermarket queue and you're about to pay for the shopping and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not sure if there's enough money in that account. I just love the fact that I can just quickly check on my mobile phone and go, oh no, it's fine. There's plenty in there. It's not a problem. Or I can quickly transfer it just by tapping a couple of buttons. So I'm really loving that at the moment. Uh, it's one of those things that really makes me appreciate technology and I do think that those of us, you know, if you're at a, of a similar age to me or older, uh, you're probably like me in that you have a greater appreciation of these really simple tech things um, that help you out in your everyday life. And hopefully you agree with me on that one. Now, my eighth thing that I'm enjoying at the moment, and I'm going to get to a couple of musical things here, is the GarageBand app on iPad or iPhone. Now, GarageBand is... You know, it's not everything. It's not an everything app which does all the things you could possibly ever want. But gee, it does a lot. And every update that they release, you know, there's another little thing that's been added. So I'm really loving this. I just think it's got a phenomenal amount of power by providing you with a recording studio in your pocket or in your backpack, depending on which device you're using. And it's just so great to have that handy and to be able to capture creativity whenever you feel like it. There's so much you can do with this simple app. I read an article not too long ago about a young music producer. His name is Steve Lacey. And at the time the article was written, he was 18. He may be 19 by now. But he basically just uses GarageBand on his iPhone and he records straight into it. He has the iRig device which allows him to plug a guitar in and he can go straight in now. He's a really sought after music producer and the article, you know, was pointing out that you just don't need to have all these fancy tools uh, necessarily to make good music. And he himself has access to a lot of other software and tools and um, hardware and so on. But he said that he keeps coming back to GarageBand on his iPhone because it's always there with him. 
Now, lately, the updates to the GarageBand app have included things like a drum step sequencer, which I really love. I wasn't quite convinced that we needed another option for creating drum patterns in GarageBand. There was already so many in there. But I'm really happy that they've finally added a step sequencer because I think it's the way a lot of uh, students think about drum patterns. And a step sequencer is basically like a, a kind of a grid scenario where each line is a separate sound. So the top one would be perhaps the kick drum and then snare drum and then hi-hat going sort of downwards. And then you basically tap squares to create a sound on a certain beat in the bar. And it's a great visual way to create a drum pattern. You can easily make changes. Uh, it's just really easy. It's kind of like a graphic notation version of drum patterns. That's how the way I think about them. And it can kind of lead on quite easily to doing more traditional notation versions of the drum patterns that have been created. So I'm really loving that that's in there now. There's still about seven other ways to create drum patterns as well in the app, but I think this one is going to be a frequently used one amongst students. In addition to that, they've added, uh, well, a while ago they added some uh, Chinese, like they've sort of started to add world instruments. And so there was a set of Chinese instruments, which were really great. Uh, they've also added now some Japanese instruments as well. And just recently, as of Literally a few days ago, they added a new set of toy box uh, sounds and loops for you to use. And they're kind of cool. They're, I think they'll be quite good for some student compositions and things. And so you can play those toy box sounds on a keyboard. And there's also, I think, part of uh, some of the drum kits, you can access those sounds too. So it's things like, uh, from a percussive point of view, there's a set of uh, pots and pans sounds. So sort of like things from your kitchen. Uh, there's like a toy piano type sound. There's a, a marimba sound, like a toy marimba sound and a few other things as well. So I think they're going to be really great to use with students. I'm about to get into GarageBand in a really big way because uh, it's becoming more and more apparent that I really need to update the GarageBand course information that I've got inside the online community. So I spent an entire plane trip pretty much to Perth, which is uh, from Melbourne where I live. It's a three or four hour trip across on a plane. And I spent most of my trip there just last week or maybe the week before planning out the new GarageBand iPad course that I'm going to do and so I'm going to I've put together a list of sort of behind the scenes teachers tips first of all and then there will be a series of lesson plans to go with it so I'm about to get into the the sort of the latest version of GarageBand in a big way and immerse myself in it so I can think about how how all these things can be used really well with students. I think there's so much in this app. There's a lot that is not explored by teachers that I come across, you know, in, in person in workshops or conference presentations. And I know that a lot of people are just sort of using it on a maybe a surface level and there's a lot of hidden cool things that they may not know about. So I'm hoping to cover those in this new course. Now, number nine on my list is another music app and this one is Loopy HD on my iPad. I actually use it on my phone as well. And again, this is one that I've been using for a long, long time. I haven't used it so much lately though. And I've really loved using it to do live looping in the past. And if you're not familiar with, you know, sort of the terminology of live looping, this is the act of a, a solo performer being able to layer up all the parts of a piece so that they can perform over the top of them just by themselves. Now, the reason it's been on my mind lately is that we've had Ed Sheeran here doing his part of his concert tour, his world tour, just done all the cities in Australia. And I was really lucky to go to the Melbourne concert. And I knew already ahead of time that basically it's just him on stage. And if you didn't get a chance to see him live performing or aren't going to, I think he's still doing a little bit more of his tour to come. Uh, but basically, it's just him on stage. There is no band, no one else. There's no drummers. There's no other guitarists there. There's no other singers. It's just him on stage. And it just reminded me how impressive technology is that it can allow someone like him to create what sounds like a full show. It sounds like a full band is performing. And I just love the fact that it's only him on stage. Now, he doesn't use the Loopy app, which is the one I use. He uses a guitar looping pedal, but it does roughly the same thing. 
It basically means that he can start off by laying down a rhythmic track and he usually does that just by tapping on the body of his guitar or he might lay down a guitar part to start with and then add the rhythmic track after that. And he keeps layering on top of uh, the tracks on top of one another until he builds up a full sound, a full backing track, and then he sings the part over the top. Now, I'm kind of guessing that a lot of people in the audience at the concert would not have even been conscious of the fact that there wasn't a band or that he wasn't singing to a pre-made backing track. And actually, in one of the early songs in his set, he actually pointed out (laughs) and said, look, I just need you to know that I'm performing everything, all of the parts that that you're hearing tonight, I'm performing them live in front of you. And he cited a time where he had been on stage and there was, um, he copped some flack from that, you know, performance because people did think that he was using pre-recorded backing tracks, but he actually wasn't. He had recorded them all live. It's just that people didn't understand that he was using technology to help him do that. So I haven't been doing it much lately. Ed Sheeran's inspired me to get back into it and I'm hoping to maybe make a few videos of arrangements that I'm, I do. I personally um, mostly do it just with singing. So Ed Sheeran, of course, is playing a guitar and singing as well. But I've been doing mostly singing ones where it uh, ends up being like an a cappella arrangement. So I find it lots of fun. It saves you having to organise anyone else to come to your rehearsals and performances because it's just you. <laughs> and so it means that I can do all this stuff without, um, you know, without needing to invite a lot of friends over, which is also nice, of course, from time to time. But I love the creativity that it allows me. Definitely going to get more into that. And I've done some workshops in the past. Teachers have loved it when I've shown it. It's one of those things that goes down really well at conferences because people come along to the session not really knowing what it is or how it might be used in education. And when they see it, they're like, oh, yeah, that thing. I've always wondered how that works. And, you know, they can go back and try it out for themselves. So if you have an iPad or iPhone, and you want to try live looping, I can highly recommend Loopy HD. It's the app actually that, um, what's his name, Jimmy Fallon uses on The Tonight Show. He's used it quite a lot on The Tonight Show. He started off, I think the first one was with Billy Joel and they did like The Lion Sleeps Tonight. But he's used it a lot of times uh, since then. And if you look up on YouTube, you can see performances on there. He's done one with Queen Latifah. I think maybe Will Smith and a number of other artists too. So definitely go and check those out. My very final thing tech related that I'm really loving right now is the ability to watch videos and shows while I'm doing mundane household chores or tasks. Now, this might sound strange, but The thing that I do is I use time, particularly time where I'm in the kitchen cooking or cleaning up or washing up or whatever it is, I use that time and I put on a video that I've wanted to watch. It might be something like a TED Talk. I see a lot of TED Talks and I think, oh, I just don't have time to watch that right now. But I try to keep a little list or just note it down and save it up, maybe even leave it open on a tab on my laptop. And I save it up for a time where I'm cooking or cleaning in the kitchen and I watch it then. Now, it's a fantastic thing to do. Um, I already really like cooking anyway, but it makes me look even more forward to those times because I know that it's a time where I'm going to get to do something enjoyable as well as the cooking uh, in the kitchen. So TED Talks is a great thing. YouTube videos, which are sort of work related, I suppose. Again, there's often a number of YouTube videos that I'd love to watch. And sometimes when I come across them, I might see them come up in my Facebook feed, but I just don't have time to watch it right then. I try to remember them or, or click save in Facebook and save the video link and then come back to it at a time where I've, I can actually watch it when I'm in the kitchen. Uh, sometimes I'm not in the kitchen. Sometimes I might be doing other things too, you know. you can. It's amazing the places that you can watch TV shows or videos online. I usually watch them on my iPad, but sometimes it's on my phone. Uh, it can be great to do this while you're waiting for something, waiting for someone. Perhaps you've just gone to pick the kids up at school and you're a little bit early. Um, you can sit there in your car and watch videos there and it's a great use of time. 
I also uh, listen to podcast episodes and I've spoken about this a lot in the past. Uh, This is a time, sometimes I'm just listening to a podcast episode, maybe not watching something and they are really useful because you can kind of do multitask a little more easily with a podcast episode so you can also listen while you're driving or exercising or um, any of those other things where you need hands, you know, both hands might be doing something and you need to sort of concentrate, but you can listen at the same time. My uh, guilty pleasure too is watching TV series like I know many of you out there do. I, I do love my binging on TV series and I really don't ever watch a TV series sitting on the couch. I pretty much only ever watch them when I'm in the kitchen. And so I get through a lot of TV series and episodes this way, things like Designated Survivor and Homeland and uh, Billions, I've just started watching that one, and um, Travellers, which is on Netflix, many others as well. I just wait for the next episode and I watch it while I'm doing something else. And it makes it feel a little less indulgent, like I'm wasting time because I'm doing something useful at the same time as watching. So I hope that you do that too. I'd love to know if you actually do that or is it just me? Uh, It's amazing the amount of of watching you can get through in that way and really not feel too guilty about it because you're doing useful things at the same time. Now, I hope you enjoyed my 10 tech things that I'm loving at the moment. Um, As I mentioned, I'd like to know, do they resonate with you? Maybe you've got something else cool that is really helping you out at the moment or that you just appreciate because it wasn't around when you were growing up or something like that. If you would like to let me know about that, you can uh, comment under this podcast episode on the website or uh, mention it to me on social media. That would be a great thing to do. So that's it for episode 50. I can't believe we finally got here. So exciting. And I'm really looking forward to the next 50 going out and getting to the next milestone of episode 100. So thank you for being here and listening today. And if this is the first episode that you've listened to, don't forget that there are 49 other episodes and you can go back through the archives, uh, whether that's on iTunes, if you subscribe through iTunes or even directly on my website, you can go back there and look at all the previous episodes and listen to the ones that have happened in the past. And a reminder that if you'd like more help with using technology, I'd love you to come and join me inside the Midnight Music Community, which is an online space for music teachers to learn more about technology through online courses and video tutorials, lesson plans, tips and personalised support. For more information about the community and a special offer for podcast listeners, go to midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 50. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.